Hey, hey, everyone. Welcome to Unique Ways with Thomas Gerard and Audio Podcast. Got an awesome guest on today. He's the co-founder of Giant Ant, an animation studio in Vancouver. Giant Ant has been awarded at the Daytime Emmys, ADC Awards, the Clios, and One Show, and has been named four times on Working Not Working's list of 50 companies freelance creatives would kill to work for. Please join me in welcoming Jay Grandin. Welcome. Hello. Thanks for having me on. Ready for 20 questions? I think so. Okay. Question one. Tell me a little bit more about yourself. What do you do? Well, um, I expect you're asking what I do for work, which you just touched on a little bit. So I run a commercial animation studio called Giant Ant. Just started with my wife, Thea. Um, and these days, I guess my most important role in the studio is to, to curate the conditions for us to make great work. So which opportunities are we going to pursue? What insights are we going to apply to those opportunities? What kind of team are we going to do it with? Um, I think I do my best work, which is helping us do our best work when I take the time to properly understand a brief, mix it in interesting ways with a combination of sensibilities of the people in the room. So um, that's kind of my role. Um, and I suppose more than that, what I try to do is curate the conditions for the leaders in our office to take that way of thinking on as their own process as well. So uh, mentorship and, and condition creating. Great, and just a note for our audience, um, you know, we're recording here in Vancouver, Canada. If you're interested in the bigger Vancouver episodes, definitely check out the episode with Marion Banshees. It was a great one. Um, so question two, what's a key piece of knowledge that makes you different? Um, I, <laughs> I don't know if I can claim that I've got like a key unique piece of knowledge, but, um, I do think a lot about the relationship between things. So one thing I think about a lot, um, are the story arcs that I work as a part of. So for example, a product has a short story arc. And then as creative people, we have our own career story arcs and we're all at a different point of those story arcs. And then as a studio, we've got our own team. We've kind of got a trajectory and, um, our own kind of legend that we're trying to build. And then our clients have their own story arts. So, um, you know, as individuals and as brands, you know, and we're all kind of uh, different shapes and sizes and at different places in sort of the journey toward actualization, different points of tension around those things. And the thing that I think could be amazing is if we find a way to be thoughtful enough to line those story arts up in time so that they're in harmony during a project and so that one of our successes helps their success or vice versa so sometimes that works and uh, we can kind of align all the ambitions to serve one another and it feels a bit like magic perfect and number three why this of all things why do you do what you do you know that's a pretty good question <laughs> or uh, a question i wish i had a uh, kind of more concise answer to you but to be honest um I fell into animation into giant by accident and my first career was a short one um but it was an industrial design and I always expected I'd go back to that with animation being a little dalliance that happened for a little while kind of just as a blip but I'm still here so um but the thing I love or love about industrial design is that it's a generalist profession and one that connects other disciplines so you know, engineering and ergonomics and sociology or whatever into a single object that is there to make some part of your day easier or more delightful. Um, in some ways, it's about learning enough about all the intersecting elements and requirements and then telling a little succinct story about it in the form of this single object that's there to um, reduce friction for us in some way or create delight. So it took me a while to figure it out, but I think so much about what I do or what we do at Giant is the same. And it's sort of about understanding business needs of all kinds, often really complex topics and understanding the context that they live in. And then understanding what and how people will connect to the topics and understanding who we are as a team and what we can bring that's new. Like what's our unique kind of perspective artistically and then serving it back. Um, and hopefully kind of like industrial design is a succinct little story that makes people challenge the way they the aspect of their world. So um, I think that that is the thing that keeps it exciting and why I'm still here. 
Great. And some people struggle with number four, but the question is, what does your future look like? Um, I, I struggle with it too. I think more and more lately, I find this topic hard to think about without a bit of fear. Um, but I hope it involves some hand tools, maybe a vegetable garden, maybe some goats or something. Nice. I don't know. Great. And number five, uh, we say is unique to this show. The question is, let's talk about location. How does the notion of place play into what you do? This is a tricky question. And I think before COVID, I might've had an answer about creating an interchange space for creative people to do their work. Um, but the past few years have been really different and difficult. And, you know, we've become more distributed. Uh, and I've had an internal circle about what place means. I think, you know, our, our sort of comfort with remote work and those kinds of things um, has changed, you know, the way I used to think of a place in terms of our office. Um, and I think, I think a lot about how to have place or make place and space for a group of people um, when the idea of here isn't necessarily a physical location, but just, just sort of a cluster of Slack channels. Um, so I think, you know, I think a lot about sense of place as a sense of belonging. And um, I'm, I'm still trying to figure that out. I'm, I'm trying to figure out the sense of place in a post-COVID um, nurturing creative environment. And, and I'm not there yet, but there's, there's work to be done for sure. Great. So number six is if you had to start from the beginning, what advice would you give your former younger self? You know, I feel like my life has unfolded just the way it was meant to without too many big creative or corrective mistakes. Um, and when there were there, when they happened, they helped me learn a lot. I think one pattern I've had to learn is that the more I really listen and trust my own intuition, sort of my gut, I guess, the more enjoyable the outcome. So I might give myself that hot tip to prevent a bit of friction. Great. And what's a day in your life like? My day looks a lot like the day that somebody in their early 40s would have. <laughs> so I usually get up around seven and make a coffee. And then I get right into the morning that is with my kids. So I've got eight-year-old twins. I make a couple of breakfasts, I make a couple of lunches. I argue with them about things like whether or not they need to wear underwear or brush their teeth. My answer is always yes, they do. Um, and then I walk from the school, which is a few blocks from my home. And then I walk to the office from there, which is another few blocks away. So not a lot of time in the car, which I think is a, a, a measurement of enjoyment <laughs> in some ways. Um, and then my days, uh, most of them, I spend a good chunk of time on calls and in meetings. So a mix of strategy and business health conversations with leadership at Buck, which is our sister company in Los Angeles uh, and New York, and conversations with clients about the work we're doing or the work that we might do. Uh, lots of conversations with the team about ongoing projects. Uh, hopefully I'm able to sneak in a run, sometimes at lunch, sometimes kind of at the end of my day. Um, and then it's likely that I'm, you know, taking my kids to soccer or a swim club or something before we have dinner as a family, which I think is an important thing to do. And then after the kids go to bed, I might tinker with uh, with a creative project. So uh, right now we're designing um, a group of cabins uh, that we're renovating on Salt Spring Island. So that keeps keeps my evenings uh, often occupied. And sometimes my wife and I just you know, watch a show like a normal couple of people. Great. And so eight is around lifelong learning. It's a popular topic. How do you stay up to date? Um. I think some of my great shames are around the things that I haven't learned. Uh, for instance, I always thought I would go to architecture school and that I'd become fluent in French, but I have not done those things yet. Um, you know, I, I find that life is really busy and I'm learning all the time, but uh, like a lot of time is sort of a passive learning. I find that I learn the most from surrounding myself with people who are engaged and who kind of by accident or on purpose challenge my assumptions about the world and about myself. Great, and tools. What tools do you use? Do you use digital and analog tools? Um, I do. I, I'm not kind of like 
your classic digital nomad. I, I've got a laptop like everyone else. Uh, I spend a lot of my day touching it, but I don't really identify with um, my tools or their portability or technology necessarily as a source of identity. Um, I think, you know, if I'm traveling for work, I, I tend to feel resentful if I spend all the time looking at my screen. I'd rather just kind of be in an analog space. And sometimes that analog space is just like observing and digesting and uh, absorbing what's going on around me that I can sort of redeploy once I'm back at my station. But, you know, I, I've got notebooks, I've got a laptop. I kind of use those things to get my things done, but, um, you know, but I don't, I don't necessarily feel defined by my tools. Nice. And halfway number 10, how do you deal with work-life balance? Well, high balance is hard. Um, a lot of people say this, but I think kids are a great regulator in this area. Before Lee and I had kids, we worked like crazy people. And, um, you know, because we worked together and we loved our work and we loved being with one another, the work-life divide didn't really exist or it never um, struck us as something that had to be in balance with one thing on either side of a slash mark. So, um, but after our kids were born, you know, things changed and I learned to take work life balance, you know, way more seriously, or at least take it seriously for the first time. Um, I work really, really hard when I'm working, but when I'm at home, I work really hard to be present or as present as I can be. And, you know, sometimes the best I can do is like be in the same room without holding a phone uh, while I work through something in my head, but um, I'm still convinced that sort of being there is at least physically is better than not being there at all. The best advice I ever received from a, about parenting was just, you know, spend more time on the floor. And, and I try to do that. Great. And you kind of answered this, but the question is, if you weren't doing what you do now, what would you be doing? Yeah, I don't know. I'd probably be going to architecture school and trying to learn French. Um, I guess I'm joking, but I'm also not joking. Nice. And what would you not like to do with your career? Um, anything that doesn't require my creative energy. Great. And how about a favorite word, quote, or sentence? Uh, something that I tell myself often to stay on track is that everything I put in the world is a statement of my taste. And um, it really causes me to think about, you know, how I'm interacting with people. Uh, how, what I'm making and putting in the world, whether, whether when I say the work is good enough, if it is good enough, those kinds of things. Um, and I also like one of the things I learned uh, when I was at my car is if you leave it to the last minute, it only takes a minute. Nice. And how about a least favorite word quarter sentence? I'm not a fan of, yeah, but. Um, but I've got to say I'm guilty of this one all the time and I'm really trying to get it out of my vocabulary. And I guess more importantly, getting it out of my, um, my headspace as far as a reaction to something. If you had to choose one word to describe yourself, what word would you choose? Um, the aspirational answer is probably thoughtful. Um, but in the true sense of the word, I don't know that I'm always considerate, <laughs> although I aspire to be, um, but I, I do, I do put a lot of thought into everything I do for better or for worse. Cool. And what keeps you up at night? What keeps me up at night is the, uh, what feels like the accelerating pace of my kid's childhood, um, and kind of in combination with that, how climate change and AI might affect their adulthood when they get there. Final stretch was the dream you're chasing. Um, what's the dream I'm chasing? This will seem flippant and maybe not true, but I feel like I'm living it. My, my life is really wonderful. I, I'm doing the things that I love with people I love and... Um, I kind of think that's the dream. What inspires you? Probably the fear of failure more than anything else. Advice, any advice you'd like to share? 
Um, I, I'm going to try not to position this necessarily as advice, but something that I've learned slowly by making lots of mistakes over many years is that um, there's always a wonderful creative solution to problems of any scale. And I think often we or I make mistakes by trying to apply a solution of the wrong scale to a problem um, that it doesn't match. And, um, and usually that sort of mismatch results in you know, disappoint, disappointment and tension. And I think um, you know, if we could be really thoughtful about yeah, understanding the scale of the problem that we're embarking on and um, and uh, not underplaying or overplaying what we're trying to do to solve it. There's a, it, it always works out better. Great. And finally, number 20, how can our listeners keep tabs on you? What's their call to action? Um, well, I, I'm pretty inactive on social media these days, but, uh, I can be found at my full name on everything. So J-A-Y-G-R-A-N-D-I-N, Jay Grandin. Um, you can also follow the journey of giant ant, um, on our website, which is giantant.ca or at giant Instagram on Instagram. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for joining today. You know, super exciting to have Giant Ant on the show, um, you know, following you guys forever, of course. So thank you so much. Thank you so much.